beautiful thing <laughs> to be surrounded by others making this choice to worship through trials. Um, that is what we find in Daniel um, when he was thrown into the lion's den. I'm going to read a little bit out of Daniel chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied. It was not them. It's the wrong thing. I prefaced that wrong. Ignore that. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O oh king. Who knows this next part? But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, O oh king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. A lot of you know the end of the story, that there was a fourth man in the fire, the angel, who protected them, and they walked right out of that fire without their clothes burned. I love this song that we're going to sing. There was another in the fire. There is another in the fire standing next to me, because the truth is we have a God who does stand next to us in our trials, and there is grace through all of that. But when I read this story, I see men who were standing for a truth of a God and they weren't gonna bow to another God. And when I see the, the Israelites walking through the waters and the seas parting, they were, they were fleeing slavery and doing what God has called them to do. And I think my fear is that maybe there's some people, and please hear me, this is not a blanket statement, okay? I wonder how many of us are in a fire that we weren't supposed to be in and that God is there, he's with us and maybe you're bouncing around in these waves and God's like, hey, let's get out of there. Maybe, maybe the, there are some choices that we make that are making that fire. Am I making sense? And God is there in our midst and he's holding and, and there is grace and he is good and he is with us, but he says, it's time to get out because he has called us to a life without sin and we know that sin brings. You're following me? Again, don't mishear this is not a blanket statement, but I felt, I felt led to say that and so I said it. But here we stand as a whole church who all bring different stories and testimonies and how cool that we can all collectively cry out that our God is with us every step of the way no matter what our story or our testimony is it can be that God is good and he is here so present and so close to us and he is worthy of our praise church let's continue worshiping him There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There was another in the fire.
church. And now as we've sung together with one voice, we're going to pray together. So read these words with me on the screen. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, good morning. Believe it or not, Amy and I did not rehearse this beforehand, but I am going to talk to you this morning for just a few minutes on this idea of sharing our stories. Uh, this month, we are talking about the life of David, and David was a, the second king of Israel, and we have so much of his life recorded, so many of the highs and also so many of the lows. David was the author of many of the Psalms. So the Psalm that Amy wrote, that was one that he had authored. And so we have so many glimpses into his mind, into his heart, into the way that he saw God, the way that he felt loved by God. And part of growing our faith, it isn't just always just the time that we spend alone with God, the time that we spend studying and praying and reading our Bible. There is a huge part of our growth that comes through this habit of sharing with those around us what God's doing in our lives. I've started practicing this with the kids upstairs and leaving space every Sunday for them to just share this week, maybe where they, where they felt God prompting them to, to be kind when it would have been easy to not, where, where he's teaching them about patience, where they see him working in their family and their friends. And can I tell you, it has been such a gift to hear them reflecting back on their week and pointing to the times that, man, he was with me in that. This was really hard and confusing, but I knew that I could trust God with this. And often they will, they'll flip it back around on me. And I think I've shared this with you that it, it was a little jarring the first time that one of the kids asked me, well, Miss Mara, what's, what's God teaching you? Or what's he been up to in your life this week? And I thought, hmm, well, that seems, that seems pretty personal. Like, great. Right? <laughs> Thank you for laughing because I realized in that moment that when I shrunk away from that, I was like, I think I need to exercise that muscle a little bit more. I need to be a little quicker. So this morning, I am bringing um, something very near and dear to my heart. In this bag, I have a collection of journals and these journals represent some of my most deepest, heartfelt concerns and cares going all the way back to 2008. I did find my journal that went all the way back to 2005, and it was pretty ragged and not really in transportable uh, fashion. But there are days when I sit there and I go, share my story, God. Like, what, what do you want me to say? So many people would look at my life and think it's gone just according to plan. I can't really talk about this huge crisis moment where if not for God, I would. And then he goes, wait a minute. What do you mean you can't talk about those moments? Do you truly not believe that without my power working in you, that you wouldn't be just a mess, that your life would not be falling apart? And he reminds me of his grace and the ways that he has sustained me. And then I flip back through these. And I come across those very real and painful times in my life that it's easy to forget. It's easy to gloss over and tie them all up and say, yep, God was working all through that. But I come across those times where I say, God, where are you in this? I don't understand. This feels so broken. This feels like no one could ever fix it. And then, believe it or not, sometimes there's that next journal entry that goes, God, I don't understand how, but it's fixed. Then there's also the ones, though, that it's still not fixed. But I have found so much, um, so much growth and so much joy in the fact that I have these as a reminder, as a very real way for me to look back and see how God has worked and moved through my life. And so I don't know, maybe I'm encouraging you today. If you have never taken the time or if you've thought, man, I'm going to just remember all these things. I lived it, right? How could I forget? If you've never tried this, um, this habit or this idea of 
writing your story to practice being able to share it. I even one time was challenged to write an elevator pitch. So I have, I have an elevator pitch of what my life was like before and after Jesus has totally transformed my life. I've got that. But sometimes we need to go a little deeper and we need to go back and revisit those seasons and remember. Um, David is sometimes well known for his, his great moments. He uh, defeated Goliath. He was anointed as king as a teenager. He was the least likely of his family. God worked in some really unusual ways. But David is also really well known for um, an incident with a woman named Bathsheba who was not his wife, and yet he took her as his wife anyway and even arranged for the murder of her husband in the process and so many things. But this is, this is one of the things that we know him best for. And when he was found out, when the prophet Nathan brought that to his attention, we kind of have a little glimpse into what David's journals looked like. And he, um, in Psalm 51, writes, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And he talks about his sin and knowing that he has sinned and he needs God to transform his heart. And when I read back through these sometimes, I can testify to the fact that God renewed a right spirit within me. He renewed a right spirit in the way that I saw him. He renewed a right spirit toward my husband, towards my children, towards my friends. And I just, I want to give him the glory for that. But I also want to encourage you to maybe think about starting to record your story. Being willing when somebody says, hey, God, what's, up? Hey, what's God up to you in your life? Not going, ah, they're trying to pry at my most personal, but know that they're trying to say, hey, God's working in my life. Is he working in your life too? I, I want to maybe compare notes. What's he teaching you? So one way we grow our faith is by spending time with God. We grow it by spending time with others. We grow it by serving and using our gifts, but we also can grow in our faith by being willing to share what he's up to in our lives. I'm just curious, um, who in this room has ever heard the word sanctification? Yeah, yeah, okay, you've heard that word. Okay, holiness. Anybody in this room ever heard the word holiness? You can bring that up, Chris. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, just right here. You know, those are, are buzzwords, of course, in, in our denomination. And, you know, I, I've grown up in the Nazarene church. That's, that's all I've ever known. And so the ideal of holiness, the, the word sanctification, all those words were very important to me. I, I've heard them my entire life, and, and sometimes I've understood them better than other times. And, 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 and if you've been around the Nazarene church a, a long time, then th those are words, sanctification and holiness, that you hear often. Uh, now, now, these words aren't just significant to our denomination, uh, you know, just because we're classified a holiness denomination does not mean that the word holiness or sanctification is only relevant to us. As a matter of fact, you cannot read the Bible. You, you cannot read the Bible without getting into these terms, holiness and sanctification. And so two weeks ago, we, we started focusing on uh, this concept in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In Hebrews 12, 14, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy. Without the holiness, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Okay, so who wants God to be active in your life? Raise your hand, right? And so, you know, this means that holiness is something I should want, this ideal, and sanctification, holiness. These words are translated in the Bible almost interchangeably, this ideal of being sanctified, this ideal of being holy. These concepts are important to the biblical writers. Matter of fact, 1 Peter says, be holy because God is holy. And so there's this concept, this ideal of holiness, of sanctification. It's this call of God on our life. We were created. You were created for holiness. You were created to be set apart for God. That is a purpose, the purpose of your life, to be sanctified, to be holy. 
Now, now, sometimes I think in my life, maybe not in your life, I've heard this word as if it's just this demand of God in my life. And I keep coming back to the same phrase, holiness is not what God wants from you, it's what God wants for you. It's God giving you life, not God taking your life. And so when we talk about this ideal of being sanctified, giving everything to God, being holy, it's not God taking life, it's God giving life. So we'll be focusing on that for this, this month. And we, we, we used, when, when I began the study through 1 Thessalonians as I organized this, and, and by the way, I organized this weeks and weeks ago. I didn't just all of a sudden tag Josh with the fun message last week, right? It was in plans. And, and I, I guess I had running on the mind because I was thinking of my marathon training and, and, and the series this summer we're, called, we're calling it Finding Our Stride. And we, we began with people are the priority of the kingdom. And we began with this idea of finding our target. If you're running, you want to be running in the right direction, right? You don't want to run 26 miles the wrong direction. That would be a bummer. Um, and so we talked about finding our target. Then, then, in this section of the, the series, we're talking about finding our form. And holiness is the posture of the kingdom. And so when I'm running, I've been working very hard this time on making sure my shoes are good, that I'm running in the best form that I can. You know why? I don't want to get hurt. <laughs> and so form matters. And, and holiness is the posture of the kingdom. It's the, it's the form of the kingdom. And, and then we're going to finish with finishing strong uh, as we move through 1 Thessalonians. You know, we're living a marathon, not a sprint. Your life is a marathon, not a sprint. And so finding a form that allows you to complete the race matters. Holiness, sanctification, giving your entire being, your entire life to God and letting him work, be at work in your life, that is the form that will allow you to finish the race. So we, we dealt with this word the first week, and, and the word has two significant meanings. It's, it's one part of it in the ideal of sanctification. Josh used the word consecration, but, but it is the word sanctification. It, it means I am giving myself to God. And so part of sanctification, part of holiness, is this process where I take my life and I give my life to God. And then there is a part that God plays. In this holiness, God plays the part of transforming us from the inside out. So we give ourselves to God. We give our circumstances to God. We give our sexual life to God. We give our intimate life to God. We give our relationships to God. We give our vocation to God. And when we give God everything, then God has the freedom to begin to transform us, change us from the inside out. When we give ourselves to God, and in exchange, God gives his spirit to us. That, that's a pretty good exchange, right? You, you give me yourself, and I will give you all of me. And once again, we're dealing holiness, sanctification. This is a relationship word. This is not a religion word. It's a relationship word. It, it, it's defining our relational interaction with God. What God is calling us to, it's, it, it's, it's the re center of everything. And, and just imagine that relationship is the center of everything. That God calls us to this holiness, sanctification, consecration, where we're giving him our all and he's responding with his spirit. In any relationship, trust is essential. And trust is essential in my willingness to give myself to God. I'm willing to give myself to the people and the things I trust. And God wants us to trust him enough that we give him our all. That, that difficult relationship you're dealing with, God wants you to trust him enough to give that to him so that he can sanctify that relationship, set it apart, and transform it. Trust. Trust leads to holiness. When we can trust God, then we can give ourselves to God. So the first week I focused on this passage. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. 
And then last week, Josh, I, I tell you, I, I, I said, Josh, don't talk about that. No, I didn't. <laughs> Josh dove into the deep end. Why well, relaxed at the beach and listened. God wants the most intimate aspects of your life. Uh, God wants the inner workings of your life. Can, can I give you the reality of God? God wants to be all up in your business. <laughs> it's the truth. I, I mean, God doesn't want to be distant and far off. God wants to be up in your business. He wants to know you. He wants you to know him. He wants to be intimate with you, and he wants your intimate life. And you'll never be all that God wants you to be unless you're willing to submit the most intimate details, aspects of your life to God. Unless you're willing to submit to God your thought life, what you do on the computer in the middle of the night, and will, unless you're willing to submit all those details to God, you will never be able to experience God like he wants you to experience him. Now, the reality is that the most intimate details of our life are never truly private. <laughs> Even the most intimate details of your life has an effect on community. It's, it's why John, John Dunn, is that how you say his name? John Dunn says, no man is an island, right? That, that's the poem, no man is an island, because we, we can't be private to ourselves. We, the way we live our life, even our most intimate details, affects those around us. Our private life affects our community. And so Paul says you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Do you see the connection? That, that, that Paul in this passage very explicitly connects the intimate life with taking advantage of others. And Josh did a great job of exploring that last week. And, and, and when we say, my body, my rules, we are making a power statement. It's an inappropriate use of power to live in that way because it ultimately harms relationships and community. And so what Josh talks, talked about last week and what I'm going to talk about this week, it, it's, it's a continuum that, that when God says he wants control of your intimate aspects of your life, he also wants control of the relationships in your life. And these things are connected. Well, we can trust God with our intimate relationships, and we can trust God with our relationships with other folks. God wants your intimate life. God wants your relationships. Beginning in verse 9. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so, so more and more. You don't hear anything else I say today. Hear this. Holy people love others. Can you say that with me? Holy people love others. Holiness and love are synonymous terms. When we learn to be holy, we learn what it means to love. So the question becomes, how are you doing? If you were to judge God's work in your life based on your love for others, how are you doing? Okay. If, if you were going to base, if you were to base your sanctification experience on how well you love other people, people that are like you, people that aren't like you, people that agree with you, people that disagree with you, anybody ever have anyone disagree with them? If you were going to judge your sanctification experience on how you treat other people, talk about other people, how you love other people, not how well you keep the rules. 
Not, not how much of the Bible that you know. Not whether you smoke or chew or go with girls who do, right? Not, not, not about following all the rules that we have. But if you are going to base and define your sanctification based on how you love other people, how are you doing? One of the gripes I have about our church, our, our, our doctrine, is too often we focus on those things to the exclusion of love. Love is the definition of holiness. No other definition to me. And you've got to love. If you don't love, all that other stuff is nothing. Love is the definition of holiness. So it's important to define it. What, what Love, what does it mean to love? When, when we talk about love, say it like that. That's a fun way to say it. Let's say live. Yeah. <laughs> when we talk about love, what do we mean? You know, lo love is not simply emotion. It, it's not based on what that great poet Ario Speedwagon writes, I can't stop this feeling anymore, I've forgotten what I've started fighting for. Now, now you'll have that song in your head the rest of the day. That's a great summer lyric, laying on the beach. But it's an awful theology of love. Love is more than emotion. It's more than a feeling. Love is action. Love is something you do. Love is giving of myself to others. Now, there's people in your life that's really easy for, easy to do. You know, to think about the closest people in your life, your family. You know, I am so glad to be back from the ocean. All we did, you know, the kids were there. All we did was lay on the ocean or the beach and, and, and lay at the pool and spend time with the kids. What an awful experience. I'm so glad to be back here. You know, you, you experience it. It's, it's not hard to give of yourself to your family. You know, it's tied to emotion. There's an emotion to that. There's a romance in the relationship with my wife. And, and so it's not hard to do the things you do for your family. So it's beach time. You get, get up in the morning and you, you load up that wagon with chairs and with umbrellas and with towels and coolers and lotion. And, and you lug it down to the beach. And it's no problem all, at all. Not that I didn't complain, right? But I'd do it all again. But the reality is, I didn't go down the beach and look at everybody coming to the beach and say, hey, let me help you take all your stuff to the beach, right? They were on their own. So there's people that you're connected to that, that this giving of yourself is, it should be natural, that emotional connection. Love is giving of time. It's giving of attention. It's giving of emotional and sometimes financial resources. It's a willingness to give up your own way to let go of some of your power. Do you see that the power dynamics in, in, in this passage? It's a willingness to give up your own power, your own control. It's ceding your power to God. It's going back to the Beatitudes where Jesus says, be meek. When, when, when what he's saying is, yield your power, your strength, what you have to God. And God can let you inherit the land or God will keep his promises. But God calls us to love beyond our emotions and our family. You know, to a degree, you love within the church. Uh, Pursuant or by your emotions. But I believe in this place, God calls us to love beyond emotions, beyond just natural inclination. So that's why sometimes we, we organize these things, like a game night. You know, maybe you think, man, I just want to sit at home tonight and do nothing. Who likes to sit and do nothing, right? Hope you're not doing that right now. You know, maybe you think, man, it'd be so nice just to, to, to lay around, do nothing, and, and, and it's effort to get here, but 
See, that, that's love in action. It, it's taking a step. It's taking, taking time. It's, it's paying attention. It's giving of ourself. It's a great opportunity to connect. You know, we, we give of ourselves to our neighbors. Love your neighbors as yourself. And, and so it's, it's a giving. It's not, I feel, I love my neighbor. Just, I feel like my, my neighbor just like I feel about myself. It's doing, it's going, it's action. And so Tuesday night, Emily delivers meals. It's loving your neighbor. It's, it's giving of resources. It's giving of self. Uptown Friday night, it's neighbor to neighbor. If you really don't know what it looks like, follow Mary Gingry for one week. Seriously. If you were to say, what, what does it look like to love people? Just say, Mary, can I just ride around with you for one week? Because her entire life is devoted to this ideal of loving and giving of herself for others. This is a seeding of power. It's saying, God, my life is yours. And, and, and connecting to this loving God with our entire being, God begins to stretch us and use us in new ways. You see, love should stretch us. That's why Jesus says, I wish he didn't say this. Love our enemy. Jesus says, you've got to love your enemy. And, and there's an action with this love, and he, he connects prayer with love. In other words, Jesus says, listen, I, I know maybe you emotionally don't feel like this, but, but there's an action you can take, and you, connect, you can give this to God through prayer. Pray for those who persecute you, who mistreat you. These aren't imagined wrongs. These are real wrongs. And Jesus is saying, listen, you can give these to God not just in your emotions, but by loving other people through prayer. Forgiveness. See, for forgiveness is not this emotional thing. It's, it's willingness, a willingness to seed our power, our right to seek revenge. Here's the reality check. God doesn't want some of your relationships. God wants them all. God wants your great relationships. God wants your bad relationships. And the struggle of sanctification, consecration, in my life, maybe it's not been in your life, has been relationships. You know, God's pretty cool. It's the other people that sometimes give me trouble. Anybody give me an amen to that, right? You know, but God wants those relationships. So I thought about that, and, and I thought of an illustration. I, I don't know if this will work or not. But, you know, you have those great emotional experiences. You know, and God moves, and, and, and you feel so good, and you feel so pure, and and, and then you have to leave church. And, and you begin to live your life, and, and, and you come across a neighbor that's kind of a, a jerk. Ooh. You, you come across a boss that's not overly nice. You, you, you have somebody that, that really does you wrong. And all of a sudden, things begin to cloud up. And if you've not given those things to God, you just begin to feel messy and dirty. Um, the reality of, of, of it is some of you are living this. It's not that you no longer trust God. You still trust Him. You, you, you still give. You, you still serve. You, you still read your Bible. But there's all these relationship things that have begun to cloud your life. And what started as pure and clean because of relationships, that grudge you can't let go of, that person you can't forgive, that, that person that's demanding time that you really don't have, life looks more like that 
than what it started with. Can, can we admit that sometimes these are real? You really were stabbed in the back. So you, you really were mistreated. There, there's been lot, times in my life where people really did me wrong. It, it wasn't my imagination. There's been times in my life where that slight's imagined, or it's a lot less than I perceived it. And so my life is a mixture of that, and it, it's hard sometimes to determine what's what, and, and what God invites us to do is say, listen, just give it all to me. Just pour it all in, and this isn't going to work exactly like I want, and I'll just refill you. So maybe you're a little collie still. <laughs> I'll just refill you again. Perfect. I don't want it to get lost in a goofy illustration. Some of you are living with relationships that a long time ago you said yes to God and you've given them your intimate life, but there's hurts that you just won't let go of. Some of them are in the church. Some of them are in your family. Some of them are outside these walls. And I believe the invitation for you today is this, to let go. The, the reality is, when we're a submitted vessel, God can pour into us. But when we hang on to all of these hurts, then our life becomes cloudy. And so God says, listen, just, just pour your life out to me. Pour your life out to others. And I'll pour into you. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. I want to give you just a moment to respond. Um, can, 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 I, can I be bold enough to say this? If there's a relationship that you don't know what to do with, can I say you just need to come forward and give to God? That, that's the start. Um, you know, there, there, there's a, the altar in the Old Testament, they did all sorts of physical things on it. They'd pour water on it. They would pour oil on it. They would, they'd put blood on it. So there's significance, and I don't understand it fully, but there's significance in laying things physically at an altar. So what I know in this room, some of you are struggling with relationships. You're struggling with something you need to give up. And until you do, life will seem cloudy. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to give us just a few minutes to respond. Lord, help us to be obedient in these moments. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, um, you want it all. You don't want part of our life. You want all of our life. You want our intimate moments. You, you, you want us to give you those moments where it's private and just us. But Lord, as we understand Scripture, as I understand Scripture, those private moments reflect and affect my public life, my relationship, my community. And so, Lord, you want our relationships as well. The good ones and the bad ones. The hurts and the joys. You, you want them all. And you want us to lay those things on an altar before you, consecrate them, sanctify them, make them holy, give them to you, so that you can fill those relationships with your spirit. Lord, the reality is, in this room, all of us have relationships that need to be restored and renewed. Lord, it takes two for relationships to be restored and renewed. Lord, but we can do our part. Sometimes, as far as it goes, it's just forgiveness. Sometimes it moves to reconciliation. 
But Lord, we can't do these things without you. So Lord, I pray for those who have, who have not responded uh, by coming to an altar. And they know there's something wrong in a relationship. I pray, Lord, that this week they will continue to, to examine that relationship, to examine what's going on, because it affects their whole spiritual life. What was once clear and pure has become muddied. Less than what you want. Lord, we hang on to things. We hang on to grudges and hurts. And it's not to our benefit. And it's not to your glory. And it's not holiness. Lord, help us to be people who are all about love. Who love each other. Who love our neighbor. Who love our world. And not just some emotional feeling that we have, but in the way we live our life. The things that we give. The things we let go of. I pray for those who responded at the altar and those who responded with uplifted hands, Lord, that you will deal with those circumstances, those relationships that you've, you've placed on their heart and, and give them a clear pathway, direction, discernment on next steps. Maybe it's just praying for the other person. Maybe it's forgiveness, a releasing of their rights of revenge. But Lord, help us to be true to you, to heed your call. Now, Lord, we lift up Braylon. He's going away. We love this young man. We've seen him grow up, and, and we believe that you have plans for him, a desire for him. As he leaves family, Lord, may he find a community of faith, even in this military academy. May, may not let go of his faith in you, but Lord, may you strengthen it. And when he comes back to us, Lord, may he come back with a testimony of how you have been faithful even in his separation from his family and his church family. Uh, be with his family as, as they let go of him, as they let him go. And Lord, we just pray that you will be glorified in his life. And Lord, what we do in here matters. There, there's a purpose for this gathering. But the rubber hits the road outside these walls. The, these things that we lay at the altars, these things that we let go of in here, it's very easy to pick them back up. I found in my life, Lord, it's sometimes possible to forgive and then pick up that grudge once again. Lord, help us be people who know what it means to let go, to give it to you. It's in those moments of letting go, God, that, that your work can, can fulfill us, you can fill us with your spirit, and you can truly transform us from the inside out. Now, as we go from this place, Lord, we don't go from your presence, but we go with a mission. We don't stop being the church, but Lord, we go fully to be the church in our community. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.